Good morning, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. We are another day into our wait. God is coming. Jesus is coming for us. Don't give up. Don't be afraid. Many things are going to happen in this world, but we are to prepare. Remember, the bride must prepare itself for the groom. No matter what's going on around us, that is only our confirmation that everything he said is true. It is a pure confirmation that we are there. It is the time. I love you all. God loves you all. And he wants you to be ready. So he's showing you, I'm doing this for you. He, he is doing it all for you because he wants you to know it's time to be ready. There is nothing happening around you that is not in the Bible. His word has told you everything that is going on around you. And if you are reading your Bible, you are seeing it. You are, are ticking it off and saying, yes, I see it, Lord. Yes, the birth pains are coming, Lord. Yes, the earth is shaking, Lord. Yes, the wicked are rising, Lord. I see it all. There is a worldwide web. And that worldwide web is in everything. It is the, what do they call it? The something of all things. The internet of all things. It is throughout everything. We are not to be afraid of it. We are to hold strong. And we in preparation, ask yourself, are you judging yourself? Or are you leaving all the judgment to God at the end? Is that what he wants of you? In your preparation, does he want you to notice the spots or does he want to wait you to wait, leave them on and come to him? as you are, as many churches say. But is that what the Bible said? No. Is that what God told you? Don't look at, at yourself and don't clean yourself up? No. He told you if you have an unruly tongue, control it. You have a traitorous heart, suppress it. You have wicked thoughts always. Conquer it. He didn't say glide along the path to righteousness, did he? Are you floating on the path? No. He said take up your cross and go. That means you're carrying a burden. And the burden was you are, your cross is you becoming as Jesus you are dropping off when he dropped blood. You are dropping off your sins. His blood covered your sins. He never promised you that it would be easy. He said you will have torment. People will hate you. People will come after you. The evil will come for you. But you are to shake that off in his name. He even said... And this is a wonderful thing to remember. I, I'm going to read it. I know it's just a small verse, but I'm going to read it to you because this is something so important to your preparation for where we are now. I'll start at, at um, what is this? First Corinthians in the chapter 11. Um, at first it's talking about doing the communion, right? And he said, because you have to think, are you doing it for him or are you doing it for you? Are you doing it in greed? Are you doing it as a band-aid for yourself or are you doing it because you believe? And he says, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation 
to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Those who are taking, getting up on their pulpits, going, here's the blood, here's the wine, here's the bread, here's the wine. And they're doing it not in belief, but in almost mockery because they don't believe. They're doing it as a stage show and people are taking it and they're coming up and they're not doing it because they believe. They're doing it because this is what we've always done. It's a tradition. That's not the way it's done. People come in there because they're hungry. That's not the way it's done. You have to do it the right way. And he says because of that, this causes many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. Now he's not saying those with chronic pain, it's because of this. He's not saying that people who have um, sleeping disorders, it's because of this. He's talking about spiritual sleep. Those who cannot come out of spiritual sleep, they cannot accept the word of God. They cannot walk forward and prepare in God. This is what he's talking about, sleep. Their eyes are closed to the truth of the Bible. To them, it is foolishness. But when you are awake, it is not foolishness. You understand it because the grace of God teaches you and the Holy Spirit in you enlightens you. It is a different type of sleep he's talking. And yet someone who is asleep will not understand that. So I know I'm talking to, um, preaching to the choir, basically. But you, you can see where others do not understand because they are doing that. And unless someone can shake them out of that, they will continue in that. So... That tells you who, when you're speaking to somebody, why don't they see it? Because they are asleep, because they have taken it in not in belief. They have taken it in vanity, in vain. But this is the important thing for us now in our, in our preparations for the coming event. Jesus said, prepare the bride. This is a preparation that is so important. This is in his words and it is to teach you how to prepare now. We're at the tricky end. He is coming so, so soon. I don't think even I understand how soon this is. It is in God's eyes really, really soon. Now, if we go to Verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, you see that? If we judge ourselves, what does the church tell you? You don't judge yourself. No, you're right as you are. But what are we told? For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Ah, but when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So those that refuse to judge themselves, who think they can come of the, as they are, God's going to chasten them. And if they don't accept the chastening, they are judged with the world. And you know what he means by the world. You know who the world is? Do you want to be judged by the world? Or if you judge yourself, and this is throughout the Bible, judge yourself, keep yourself holy. When you judge yourself, he says, confess your sins. How can you confess your sins if you haven't judged yourself? Because if you haven't judged yourself, you don't think you have any sins. So he's saying all through, everything is, look at yourself. We are so close. We must look at ourselves. Look at yourself 
and judge yourself. If you judge yourself now, we don't get judged later. Do you see that? You judge yourself and you repent. You confess and you repent and you move forward in Christ. We are to become as Christ. If you love me, you will follow my commandments. If you love me, you will do the will of my Father. Are you doing it? Is there a blemish there that you have seen? Have you not looked at yourself lately? Are you getting annoyed? Are you getting angry? It is hard not to be angry in these days because we see so much. But may I ask you to please turn your anger into understanding. Turn your anger into seeing what they are, who they are. I, I find it impossible now not to pity because I know where they are going unless they change. Every time I see my government do something so very, very wicked and worldly and turn on God, my response has been of late. They are doing exactly what the word says they will do. But that individual, unless that individual changes and repents of what they've done, and maybe they can't turn around and change what they've done, but they themselves in their soul, if they do not repent, I know where they're going. And that breaks my heart. Because even though I think they are a terrible person in the now, I don't want them to go to hell. But unless they repent unless they judge themselves. As the Bible says, judge yourself and you shall not be judged. Unless they judge themselves and repent of what they've done, they face the judgment of the world. I don't want to face that judgment. I want to follow what the Lord has told us to do. And I know you do. But our churches for so long have told us we don't judge ourselves. But they were the wolves in sheep's clothing because they wanted you ignorant. They wanted you to skim over little things like that in the Bible. But every little word, it doesn't matter how small it is in your Bible, every word was God-breathed. So every word is so important. Now there I have spoken all this time on one little phrase. That one little phrase has told us if we don't judge ourselves, if we don't look at ourselves and, and repent of what we see in ourselves that is wrong, if we don't judge ourselves, we can't repent of it. And if we haven't repent, we are going as unrepentant people to judgment. Yes, we are covered by the blood of Christ. Oh, without that, we have nothing. The blood of Christ follow, covers those that love the Lord and put our trust in him and do the will of his Father. So we must know the will of his Father, even in those small phrases. Yes, he will chastise those he loves, but do you want to be chastised? Or do you want to say, Lord, I see it. Look. Look at this big splash on me. Lord, I've, I've sinned. Look at me. Please, I see it. Please cleanse me. Get this off me. Please, Father, I repent. Do you want to do that now and then come to him 
ready and prepared for the bride. He is looking for a spotless bride. His words, not mine. He is looking for a spotless bride. That means you've cleaned it. You've done it. You've. It's not through your works that you are saved. Many will be saved, but not everyone is the bride. If you want to be the bride, the bride is taken out. The bride is carried up. In the old world, world, they would even put the bride on a chair and the friends of the groom. Remember this, we're talking about an old civilization. The imagery is an old civilization. What did they do? There would be a contract made, the New Testament. There would be a price given, a bride price. The Lord gave his blood. He gave his blood for everybody, don't get me wrong, but we are talking about now the bride. What happens to the bride? The bride was brought to a table and the bride and groom shared a glass of wine. And the groom would say to the bride, do you accept me as your husband? And if the bride said no, then that was it. No, there was no argument. But if the bride said yes, then they would drink of the cup, the cup of the new covenant. It was a covenant made. And the groom would say, I go to my father's house to prepare a place for you. And when I have prepared a place for you, I will come back and receive you to myself. And I will not drink of this cup again until we meet again at the banquet, at the marriage ceremony. And the groom would go away and he would be building the house. He would be building everything for her. And while she was here, that was a, a one year betrothal. One year he would build the house. One year she would prepare herself and she would get to herself cooking utensils and clean clothes and she would sew things and her family would help her and they would, the aunties would make clothes for little children that would come along. Someone would give her a bowl of yeast that she would nurture so that when she went to her house, she had it. She was taking her gift to him and he would bring, come back his friends, the angels, would come to her. She wouldn't know when, but they would come, sometimes in the middle of the night, blowing trumpets down the street and everyone, it's, the groom is coming, the groom is coming. But he wasn't the first one at the door. It was his friends, the angels, and they would come and she would be, oh, she had to be ready. She had to have everything ready. She knew the season. She didn't know the day or the hour. She knew the season and she would be getting excited and she couldn't afford to not have things ready. And he would come and they would knock on the door and all excitement quickly. She would put her dress on if it wasn't that time of day. She would quickly, because it was ready. She was ready and she'd just, boom, off. And they would come and they would put her on a seat, on a chair, and they would carry her off to meet him. And then they would travel together to the house that he had prepared. Does that not sound like a bride? And yet there were all of these friends and helpers. They are not the bride, but they are still honoured and invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Everyone who believes in Christ is not the bride. There are the guests. They are still blessed and saved. Remember the king who gave no one that he invited wanted to come to the wedding. 
And so what did he do? He said, bring in everybody, bring in the, the paupers, the people that worked in the street, bring in everybody. And the king gave them the clothing. In that time, no one went to a wedding in their own clothing. The father would supply the wedding garments. That is Jesus' blood is supplied to everybody. But somebody decided they would not put on that garment and still wanted to come. Remember this story? And he came in, but he wasn't wearing the wedding garments and he thought he could sit and eat at the table. He hadn't put on the garment prepared by God. And so what did the king say? Cast him out into outer darkness. He wasn't, he wasn't of us. He didn't do what was required. He didn't clean himself up. He didn't put on the garment that was provided. This is the bride and that is the guests at the dinner. Those that were accepted to the dinner were saved. But those that refused to do and to love God but just wanted to a free ride, they were cast into outer darkness. Don't be foolish bride and just settle for salvation. So many are settling for salvation when the invitation was given to be the bride. But to be the bride, it's a spotless bride, my darlings. Those that aren't the bride. Oh, my loves. You don't want to be left. You want to be in that carried off chair. The rapture. The caught away, the hot pot. So however, however you like to use your words. You want to be the one raised up above the crowd. Look at yourself, for it is good to look at yourself. And the mirror we look through is the mirror of the commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, if you love me, well, he's not going to marry someone who doesn't love him, is he? And he said, if you love me, you will follow my commandments. They're not laws. We're not getting legalistic. Commandments are different to laws. Laws are petty. They're controlling. A law is, for instance... God said in his commandment, remember to keep the Sabbath day holy. The law was then written by the Jews and the Israelites under the principle of that and the other. God did give the Israelites a whole plethora of laws because they were they were not trusting and they were not understanding. For them, the commandments were, well, what do we do about that? But you have the New Testament. God put the law, the law in your heart. You know it. They didn't have that. This is before the New Testament. So for them, they had lived in sin and wickedness for so long. They didn't understand truth. That was a time when their life was so indoctrinated in all of these deceitful goings on. They didn't understand. And so he had to teach them. The law was the, the lessons, the teaching. But he's placed that in our hearts. We understand when God says, keep the Sabbath holy. He has put in our heart what that means. 
but he had to give them rules, laws. But they then took those laws and made more laws. So they turned a small law into a big law where you couldn't walk away from your house for more than so many yards and you had to have a string. And if you went past that string, you couldn't. If if you wanted to talk to that person over there, they had a string to come here and you had a string to go there, but you couldn't go and meet. That's not a commandment of God. That was a law. The laws were restraining, constraining. God said, keep it holy so you know, keep it holy. He said, remember the Sabbath day. You remember the Sabbath day. That is a commandment. He said, don't murder. And some people say he said, don't kill. He didn't. He said, don't murder. Wartime, people kill, yes. But even in war, you don't murder somebody. You don't murder. He said, don't covet your neighbour's possessions. That includes his wife, his horse, his ass, his, his house, his car. You don't covet that. And you go, okay, yeah, don't covet. But you don't need a law to say, well, I don't go within five feet of that and I don't look at it. I can't look, cover, we've got to cover that up. Oh, I can't cover the, the man's wife. She better be covered up. We don't do that. That's not in your heart. That's you being wicked and forcing something on someone else because you can't control yourself. And I don't mean don't cover. I, a woman is to be modestly dressed. That is her duty. It is a duty to be modest. So... None of this girls saying that, how dare he um, look at me like that when you're walking out in underwear. No, you're deliberately attacking his eyes. You're being a Jezebel spirit when you do that. You are meant to be modestly dressed. But that's another story. That is another thing. But you understand what I'm saying. The commandments, those laws are written in your heart. You understand, I do this, I do that. We're not under the law where we measure how far we walk. We weigh things in a particular manner. Everything is mental. And by that I mean um, you're thinking it through too hard. It doesn't come from thoughts. It comes from heart. You must have his, his commandments in your heart and you must have a desire to live them. Then you will look at yourself and you will desire to clean yourself up. Then you will be the bride. He's coming for a spotless bride, so clean yourself up. Yes, some of us may not be completely spotless, but he loves that you tried. He loves, some of you, it will, you'll be going right the first moment you come to him because you have seen you need him and you have instantly understood you love him and you have in that moment repented and your repentance was so full and thorough at that moment like the man on the cross his understanding was full and complete and his love and desire of Jesus was instant and that's he was accepted. Do you see that? But if you've accepted Christ years and years ago, but you're still living a bit of the world here and there, we all are. I myself, we all. The path is straight, but none of us are perfect. And we go to the edges. We are 
trying to stay there, but we all fall, fall short. So as soon as we fall short, a bit of that splashes on us and we go, oh, okay, let's judge yourself and let's clean yourself up and let's repent and confess to the Lord, you saw that, I did that, I'm sorry. I'm walking back on the path. Control yourself, control your inner man, lest it control you. But he gave us the will, he gave us the knowledge, and he gave us the word. And the word said, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. So, he told us, don't worry about judgment. Judge yourself. You know what you're doing. Look at yourself. And if you judge yourself and repent and confess with your heart, then the blood of Christ has washed you already. You don't need to be judged later. And you become the spotless bride of Christ. So on that note, on that glorious note, our God has given us so much. He has given us so much to see in this world, to confirm his word. He loves you. He loves you as only he can. This world will not love you because it loves the other. Its father is, is the one that hates it. God loves you. Jesus is coming for you. That house is ready. And his friends are on their way to lift you up to be with him. And then you will go to his father's house for the wedding banquet. All we're waiting for is that trumpet to blow now. Listen for it. But he's giving you the warning. There is still time, but not much. Look at yourself today. And judge yourself. And repent. For repentance is of the Spirit of God. It's a gift. Repentance is a gift. It's in the Bible. Repentance is a gift. Just as faith is a gift of the Spirit. Call on the name. And you will have the gift. God bless you, my darlings. Oh, he loves you so much that he wants you to know everything. He wants even the smallest word in his word. He wants you to know it's all about you. His love for you, it is a love letter. This is a love letter that tells you who he is. He is saying, this is me. I love you this much. God bless you. God be praised. It is all about his word. It is all about him. It is all about him. It's not you and me that are the ones because we're doing nothing. He did it all, but he told us how to get there. He showed us the path. May we walk that path with grace and may we walk that path in love, for he is love. God be with you all. I love you all. And I pray every day for you all. I ask that you pray for one another. We have those amongst us who are going through terrible times of illness, loved ones who are going through great illnesses. We have friends amongst us who are going through financial distresses, through environmental distress and through persecution due to the love of Christ. 
pray for it all. Pray that God will raise them up on that day. And we will be there together. I love to meet you. I want to give everybody the biggest hug. I'm a hugger who has not been allowed to hug for a long time. So I've got a lot of hugs pent up inside of me. And you may be attacked on that cloud by a little chubby old lady coming up, giving you big hugs that you will just melt into because I've got the chubbiness to make you melt in. <laughs> I love you. God bless you and God be praised. May he make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Peace beyond all understanding and the world will look at you and how can she be so peaceful? How can he have so much peace in him? Look what's going on. Because we know. He knows. God bless you. Bye bye for now, my loves. Until we meet.